Hey, yo folks, Quilly Keen here, and I have played quite a few sort of Starship Bridge Command games, whether we're talking about like solo Starship games like X4 or EVE Online, which I know is an MMO, but you're still filing a ship solo, or things like Star Trek Bridge Crew or even Artemis Bridge Command or Bridge Simulator, I think it's called. All great games. However, I really think Pulsar Lost Colony is the best Starship Command game to play either solo or especially with friends. I mean, it is definitely the sort of thing that is clearly designed uh, to uh, be ideal in multiplayer, but it works pretty well in single player. You can use bots to fill out the rest of your crew. The default bot behavior is pretty simple and basic, but you can tune it quite a lot uh, to get some pretty smart bots. Anyway, if you uh, if you are new to Pulsar Lost Colony, well, two things. First of all, as I'm recording this, it's on sale, so check Steam for that. Uh, secondly, I'm planning on doing some multiplayer live streaming of Pulsar with viewers. Uh, if you're a Twitch subscriber or a YouTube member, you should have access to the exclusive Discord. In there, there's going to be a channel where we're going to coordinate it. We're going to do some multiplayer Pulsar Lost Colony on stream because I think it's a really fun game. I played it a bunch with friends and I'm looking forward to playing with some of you guys. Anyway, with all that being said, let's go ahead and play and get into kind of a quick start crash course on Pulsar. You can play online. I'm currently in offline mode, though, because I'm going to be playing solo and showing off some things. No, no. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Stay offline, please. Yeah, good. Offline mode. Excellent. There are a variety of different ships you can choose from, including different scenarios. Plus, the ships can be of different factions. Just very quickly here, I'm going to jump in on the Intrepid, which is normally selected by default. It is a tiny ship that's very easy to get the layout of. Some of the other ships have really interesting layouts. They really feel like a cool living space. Um, but the Intrepid is great as a beginner ship because it is so simple and basic to get around, which is great. You can rename your ship here. And of course, you'll have options over here that are uh, more or less relevant if you're playing online. But again, we'll play offline mode and I'll play on standard difficulty for this little demo. Chugga, 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 chugga. And here we are. Admittedly, the graphics are on the plainer side, but small indie team and really it's about the gameplay. Um, and uh, I find the gameplay to be very enjoyable. There are five different classes you can choose from. Someone must be the captain, which means if you're playing solo, you will be playing the captain. Now that's okay because the captain, in addition to having a certain amount of uh, specific authority to do, take certain actions and organize the crew. And of course your primary role as captain is to, is to be the organizer, the coordinator, communicate with all the crew to make sure everyone's doing the same thing. But the captain is also sort of a jack of all trades character where um, there are various specialized activities like only the weapon specialist can use the main gun and only the scientist can use the main sensor dish. However, the captain can also do those things too. So you can fill in all those gaps, which makes it perfect for um, single player. You can customize your character. There are different species that have various advantages and disadvantages. I'm just going to stay with human for that kind of vanilla experience. Let's go ahead and load in. So the game is played first person over here, and we do start off on the bridge of our Intrepid class ship, which has a number of different consoles available to it. You can walk up to a console like the helm over here. You can see R pilot the ship. And in fact, if I do hit R, I am now piloting the ship. Any character can pilot the ship, but of course the pilot specialist, a specialist will have special talents that will make the, the ship pilot even better with one of those on there. Um, in this mode, we can generally control the ship with WASD to turn around, um, but we can also change to a few different flight modes. If I hit X now, all of a sudden, if I just hold down the right mouse button, it's just gonna turn the ship in the direction of the camera. Personally, not very keen on this mode. I really think the manual mode is the way to go. Again, WASD to rotate the ship. Q and E will also roll over here. And you can hold down the right mouse button. And if you do, now all of a sudden WASD, instead of rotating the ship, will strafe you. Strafe you? Will slide you left and right, forwards and backwards, as well as Q and E will send you up and down. So these are really nice refined maneuvering in situations where you have to get in somewhere tight. Like for example, if you're trying to get into that repair bay behind you, this little circle behind you, that is the direction to the aft of the ship. And there's a little crosshair that shows where we are pointing in the distance, which is handy dandy. Uh, if you are a pilot, by the way, uh, you can hit space bar to show sectors. This is how you will jump from one star system to another, by the way, the map is very large. There's a lot going on there. Um, if the pi you can align to one of these star systems, the lighter labels like this one here are within range of our jumps, which is what this blue circle is on the map. That's how far as we can go. Um, the darker ones are out of range. And if the captain were to right click on some sort of system, which would set a course, 
So you can see right now the course would involve jumping to 1647, which is the edge of our maximum range. Uh, the 1647 system, there it is down there, will be highlighted by a blue circle. So when the captain sets a course as a pilot, your job will often be to go ahead and line up. The other major thing you'll be doing as a pilot, of course, is dealing with combat, which where it's really important to note the location of the guns. Here on the Intrepid, all three of our turrets are on the top of the ship. The main cannon is at the rear and two smaller turrets are at the top. So if you're getting to a fight on this ship, you're really going to want to try to make sure to keep enemies above you if at all possible, so that your guns can fire. Those guns do have to be operated by crew members. You'll see that happening. And every time the main gun goes off, by the way, your ship will get like physically like bumped from the strength of that cannon. It is really beastly. There's a full manual for the pilot role uh, that you are encouraged to check out. Um, let's go ahead and back off a little from that roll and take a look at other spots on the bridge. Uh, over here on the right, this is where the science officer would generally stand here on the Intrepid. We've got three screens that in, are involved mostly in sensors as well as electronic warfare. Behind us, we also have the communication panel. We can use this to open a comms channel to a station or a ship, and then someone, generally a captain, will interact with the main screen over here to to well, to interact with that ship or that station or whoever you're talking to. You can click these over here. This is everything we have a sensor signal for. Uh, enemy ships will also show up in here. And more importantly, by the way, if you hold the uh, the mouse, or sorry, the uh, space bar, you can detach your mouse over here. Uh, over in the top right corner, this is gonna be all the ships that are in the area. The USS Intrepid, of course, is ourself, and enemy ships will be there. And as the captain, you can click on these ships to set them as the primary target, which is a good way to communicate things to your crew. And if you are playing with an AI crew, it will get them to focus fire on those particular targets over there. Um, as the science officer, if you do select a ship, depending on the strength of the signal, depending on how well you've detected them, you will have a variety of extra information. If you detect them at all, you will see them over here with the, along with their hull and shield strength, which is what those two gray bars are. Um, and then you'll be able to click on them and get some extra info. If you have at least this much sensor power, that's what this 20.6, this is our detection strength we have on this ship. We have maximum detection strength on our own ship because we know ourselves. Um, if you have at least this much, then you can see how their power is allocated, which is great. If we have at least this much, it opens up the potential to do a bunch of different scans to see what's going on in the ship. And then finally, if you get all the way over here, it unlocks some offensive sensor attacks, including, you know, making their uh, reactor heat generate more heat. These are really powerful attacks that are quite good if you get a very strong sensor. If you're having a hard time finding anyone, you can go ahead and ping with an active scan. This will dramatically increase your scan strength, your EM detection uh, strength for a short amount of time. You can see it's currently at 20 or 202. In a second here, it's going to drop back down to probably 20.2. There we go. As the active sensor ping goes away. Notice your electromagnetic signature. This is how easy it is for us to be detected. That also goes up while you do an active scan. There are also two shield modes over here. In addition to one being good against physical and one being good against energy, the modulate mode reduces our detection ability. We can't detect as well, but it keeps our EM signature low. Whereas static increases our detection, but increases our signature, making us easier to be spotted. There's also a virus screen over here, uh, a little bit beyond the scope of this particular crash course, but sometimes enemies will attack you with viruses. You can click the colored bar on the right to enter a mini game to resolve them. But the other thing you can do is use these programs. Um, there are a variety of programs installed on your ship. Uh, as the science officer, well, actually anyone can come up here and whack these buttons, that's fine. Uh, but generally it's the science officer's role. You can select one of these programs like emergency shield boosting and execute them. The little circles below, this is um, this is the, the amount of jumps you need to do to recharge it. Um, the way it works actually, it's not amount of jumps necessarily. If I hit tab, by the way, this is a very useful screen we can look at later. And we click on ship and we click on our warp drive. One of the things, or not click on it, but just look at it. One of the things it says here is charges per fuel. On this particular jump module, it's three. That means every time we jump, which uses up a unit of fuel, three of these little dots will fill up on our programs. And it prioritizes from left to right. So let's say we have these three programs used and we jump. Both dots on the shield boost will be filled in and one of the dots on the detector will be filled in. Um, in addition to jumping, it's also possible to specifically burn a unit of fuel to immediately generate more of these charge dots. That's something that can be very powerful in combat at the cost of fuel. And it's something you do down in engineering. So we'll look at that in a little bit. If you do get a virus though, there is an instant antivirus over here that you can launch, which instantly removes all hostile viruses 
from the ship as soon as you run it. So that's pretty good. But of course, once it's on cooldown, then you might have to do other things, but you could always ask the engineer to burn more fuel. Okay, so uh, there's that. Also, depending on your ship, you might have actual um, offensive viruses you can run as well, but maybe a little bit beyond the scope of things over here. Uh, this is the engineering station on the bridge. Uh, the engineer might decide to stand here through combat and various actions uh, because it's quite cool because you can look out the window and it looks pretty good. But the engineer could also choose to be in engineering where these consoles also exist over there. So these three screens here, as well as the coolant screen over here is all available from engineering. As engineer, your primary role will be to control the temperature of the reactor and allocate power in different areas to make sure that the ship's as effective as possible and doesn't have a core meltdown. We're going to look at the engineer screens once we get down into engineering, though. Let's take a look at the rest of the ship. We're going to leave the bridge heading aft. And again, as I said, the Intrepid class here is a very simple layout. Basically, it's, it's very linear. So we are in the forward corridor over here. These pads are cargo pads. If we do um, salvage cargo after combat, they can show up on these pads over here. We also have a teleporter. This room here is our teleporter, and this is how we interact with it. We can choose where we are teleporting to, and we just teleport there by hitting select. So if I do this, I am now on the main space stations. Now, you might get some nasty surprise teleporting some places. Some people consider teleporting to some of their spots. I think if you were to teleport, for example, to the warp station, I think that would be considered a no-no. People might start shooting at you, so just teleport off of there. Security is not happy sometimes if you teleport to these places. Um, there are rooms to our sides, but I'm just going to keep heading directly aft of the ship. So now we are in the aft corridor. We've, we're heading backwards to the back of the ship towards engineering. Notice there are more cargo pads here for more loot, as well as individual little lockers where you can go and grab some stuff out of your personal storage or put it back in. Let's head all the way back to engineering here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to save engineering for a bit because it's a little bit more of a conversation. Let me go and I'm going to head forward to the Ford uh, hallway again, and we're going to go and take a look at the science lab first. So the scientists will not necessarily spend much time in the science lab. There are some screens here for the computer access, but not the sensor screens and things aren't available in the intre intrepid science lab. So it's not a really useful place to hang out. However, we can see here the integrity of the science system. This green bar below science lab is the health of the science system it, in the middle of combat. As your ship takes damage, these subsystems can take damage. Also, if you get boarded, someone might decide to attack it. Let's simulate here. So if I go and do damage this, the science lab has now been weakened. And you can actually see this green bar here. This will make more sense when we get into engineering. This is how much power is being used by the sensor. As I keep damaging the science lab, it actually limits how much power the sensors can use. Also, I just set the place on fire. So I'm going to switch to the fire extinguisher here. OK, that was that was less than ideal. I didn't realize that. I actually took some hit point damage over in the top left corner and nearly died. Luckily, we're in the room with the medical uh, aid station, the atrium. As long as you're standing near it, you don't even have to be inside. As long as you're standing near it, it will heal you, which is great. Most rooms on the ship will have these little displays showing you the overall health of the ship, uh, shield, hull, reactor situation, but more importantly, the four subsystems, engineering, weapons, life support, and science. And we can see at a glance that the science system is indeed quite damaged. Anyone with a repair gun can go over here, click the repair gun on these systems and start to fix them up. You can get better quality repair guns. I believe the engineer starts the repair gun plus one, which does work quite a bit faster. But anyone can do repairs as need be. There you go. Our science lab is back up and running and our sensors are back to full strength, which is great stuff. Um, the uh, big thing in this science lab here is where you can get unlock upgraded talents. We're going to talk about talents. Hopefully I remember a little bit later on, but um, as you level up, you get talent points, which you can spend at the top over here in the color is the are the talents specific to your role. So these four talents are only available to the captain, for example. And then after that, these gray talents are generic talents available to anyone. Notice the captain starts with the talent that lets him use the main turret the item upgrader and the sensor dish, which are normally class specific abilities. But the captain starts with all those because, again, they're sort of a jack of all trades kind of vibe. Um, there are sorry at the bottom of the screen, some grayed out talents. These talents have to be unlocked via research. What happens is you will find some some things called research samples and you can load them into the atomizer. Um, be very careful. Anything that gets put into the atomizer will be gone forever. Um, and throwing like a fire extinguisher in there won't give you any science. It will just eliminate the fire extinguisher, which is probably not what you want. 
Once you put something in the atomizer, there'll be a little button here that you can click and it will go and incinerate everything and it will give you these little colored research tokens over here. And as you get these um, actual research um, options will show up in this list. You can click on those. They'll be researched after a little while and that will unlock a new talent that your crew can start spending points in. So that's the science lab. If we go across to weapons, this is where we actually do the pew pew shooty shooty. The weapons officer will almost certainly spend all their time in here in a regular fight. In particular, they will almost certainly be using the main turret. The main turret does need that talent to use it. But again, as the captain, you do start with it. And there's the view. Notice we are, of course, on the top of our ship, so we can only shoot things that are above us. The main turret works by clicking and holding the left mouse button. You'll see two circles pop up. And what you want to do ideally is let go of the button when the two circles overlap. And in theory, that's supposed to do more damage. Something like that. We got it at 99%. And then at some point it fires. And notice the whole ship shifted over. In this view here, we can also fire missiles. You'll notice on the right hand side, we've got a few options. Um, if we uh, left ship, we can zoom. Um, if we right click, we can fire missiles. Um, and we can also change whether we're using tracker missiles, whether we're using straight shots, which you can see right over here, the display changes See that. We can also have the missiles target different subsystems on the enemy ship as well. Uh, you can also just tap the right click for a little mini laser. This thing is great for shooting down incoming missiles while you're running on the main turret. You can also go over here. There are two secondary turrets. Anyone can use these turrets. You don't need a special skill for it. So if there's someone not doing anything useful in combat, they don't nothing urgent, they can go and grab one of these extra turrets and either use the laser turret over here or the plasma turret over here. Um, different ships will have different weapons. You can check which weapons are on your ship as well as their details by hitting tab, go to ship, go to weapons, and you'll see here the main turret as well as the two secondaries. It's actually worth noting here that our plasma turret only has a range of 4,000 meters, whereas the other two turrets have an 8,000 meter range. So you can keep that in mind when you when your pilot is positioning themselves in combat, as well as which one of the turrets are going to be operated. Um, if all three people, if we got three people wanting to use guns, I guess we'd have to be within 4,000 meters, but otherwise being within 8,000 meters is going to be more than sufficient. And again, here's the weapon system that can become damaged and can become repaired. Um, we will talk about power a little bit more when we get to engineering, but the, the engineer decides how much power goes to weapons as a whole. But from this screen, we can choose how much power goes to each individual weapon. That's what these little, um, um, triangles are. This limits how much power they can use. So the laser turret, when it's recharging, can use up to this much power, which we can actually check. The laser turret would be, let's call it 7,000 megawatts. Uh, so when it's fully recharging, it consume up to 7,000 megawatts. We can limit that. We can say, listen, when we're in the middle of combat, I want to make sure that the main turret is getting recharged the fastest. I don't want any of our power. I don't want too much of our power going to the laser or plasma turrets, which are secondary weapons. So I might say, listen, I'm going to limit both of those to one third of their maximum. Um, so if someone is using these secondary turrets, they're not going to recharge very quickly because we're not going to feed them very much power, but it's going to make sure the main turret is getting the priority. So you can make some interesting decisions with power there. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to engineering. So let's pop out. Let's head aft one more level. Let's talk about life support real quick because it's a pretty easy conversation to have. Life support room, very pretty. We got some plants here. Our life support system is there. If this thing is, gets destroyed, then we'll have no more air. Oxygen is up over here. So let's make sure to keep that nice and healthy. The other thing we can do over here is grab an exosuit. If we put on an exosuit, first of all, you will move around slower. So that's the reason why you might not want the exosuit on all the time. But the exosuit protects you from a variety of environmental hazards, uh, extreme temperatures, radiation, that sort of thing, as well as having its own oxygen supply, which is really handy. If you are playing as a robot or a Sil Silvasi, Silvani, I don't remember what the other species is called. Um, you actually uh, don't have to worry about oxygen because you're either a robot or you are in your spacesuit all the time. We cross the road over here. We get to the lounge which is just a place to hang out and have fun. We can check the ship's log. We can play Liar's Dice with our friends, but otherwise it's just here for flavor. Um, and again, bigger ships will have much more interesting and beautiful terrain. This is a very basic functional ship. Now we get to engineering. There's a lot of exciting things that go on in engineering. Uh, some of it I will cover with more or less depth in here in this video. This is a sort of crash course, quick introduction. But I will point out that these three screens over here are th the same three screens we see on the bridge. Um, although on the bridge, this screen here is the jump control and the coolant reserves is behind us. In this case, the jump controls 
is over here. So where I can initiate a jump prep um, and whatnot. So they're in slightly different position, but they're still available. Everything you, as an engineer, everything you can do on a bridge, you can also do down here. There's a few other things you can do down here as well. I talked about those computer programs and how they recharge a certain number of dots every time you jump, depending on your jump drive. Um, and I said that instead of doing an actual jump, you can actually just burn a fuel cell to charge the programs without actually doing the jump. And you would do that here. We would click load fuel, which loads a fuel cell in here. We would then pull this lever, which would consume the fuel cell, but generate those extra dots of recharge on the programs. So in battle, you're gonna to wanna to coordinate with your science officer and possibly your captain to make decisions about whether or not you are burning fuel cells um, to reload those, uh, those programs. Um, as a captain, before you leave in your first mission, you're probably gonna to wanna to buy more fuel cells. They're pretty cheap. You can carry up to 200 of them. Um, and 20 fuel cells, which we start with, does cover a lot of jumps. I mean, yeah, it's a big galaxy, but 20 jumps gets you really far, or maybe you wanna think of it as 10 jumps so you can come back. There's also these special um, warp gates, uh, which there's one in Outpost 448 where we start as a Colonial Union. Um, but these little symbols here, you can see, um, I guess I can't, yeah, I can sort of unlock the mouse. Uh, this symbol over here for warp station, which is what this is, sorry, which is what this is over here. Those things can fling you across the galaxy to another warp gate and cover a lot of terrain. So 20 jumps gets you really, really far, but a lot less far if you're gonna be using those in combat to recharge your programs. So you might wanna buy a few. Again, they're pretty cheap. All right, let's talk about the big thing with engineering. This is probably the single most important screen for the engineer. This determines where we're allocating energy from our fusion reactor. The Intrepid here starts with a military grade, right here, military grade fusion reactor. The maximum temperature it's allowed to reach is 3000 KP. I guess kilopascals because pressure and temperature is linked. I don't know, we'll just call it 3000 degrees in here. And it can output a maximum of 17,000 megawatts, uh, which would then have to be shared between different systems. And like, if we look at the weapon system, when the main turret can pull 8,000 megawatts by itself, plus 7,000 megawatts from the laser turret, plus 4,000 megawatts from the plasma turret. And if you add all this together, we get about, yeah, we get about 20,000 megawatts in total just from the weapon system, which is more then the reactor can put out. And that's actually indicated quite quickly, quite clearly on the screen. Down at the bottom is total usage. This is the total amount of power we are currently using, as well as our total capacity. The full rectangle here is the most amount of power we can generate on a reactor. We can generate up to this much power. The filled blue area is how much we are currently consuming. So we're consuming this much, we can generate this much. The weapon system, or so the other systems, these boxes represent how much they can consume. And you can see the weapon system can consume more power than is literally possible to generate by our reactor, which makes sense. We just did the math and that checks out. Now in practice, you're not firing every all three weapons simultaneously, so the weapon system shouldn't have to draw that much power, um, but theoretically it could, if we could give it that much. In practice, um, if the weapons were trying to draw as much power as possible, it would be limited by this much over here. It's also limited by these little, these little triangles, these little carrot indicators. This is, over here says, yes, weapons could draw up to this much power, but we're limiting it to this much. We can actually see that with the science lab. The science lab is active because our sensors are active. If we take this little carrot and we start bringing it down here, you will see that blue bar change because we're literally saying, literally saying, listen, science lab, you're only allowed to access this much power, period. Or we can bring this up, we can bring it all the way up here, but the science lab only needs this much. So it doesn't matter if we put it all the way here, it's only gonna draw this much. Under total usage, we can actually limit how much power a reactor is putting out in total. Same thing, so our reactor as a whole can only do this much and it's gonna be shared between all the systems that have some sort of demand. For example, if I were to start charging our jump drives, then we would see engineering is gonna start requiring power, but you can see there's not a lot in there. That's because we've limited how much power we can send in. Now, if I do this, there we go. Now they're getting fully satisfied, but notice the reactor is starting to heat up. That's what this value over here is. This is the temperature of the reactor as well as our maximum. If we hit maximum temperature on here, what happens? Well, luckily, by default, our shift safety, our core safety toggle is on. <coughs> and so what will happen is if we hit max power, the ship will actually shut itself down for a few seconds. That is determined by the emergency shutdown or cooldown value here, seven seconds. So with this reactor, if we were to hit 3000 degrees, our ship would shut itself down for seven seconds to cool off. If we were to turn that off, 
then it's quite interesting. We can actually overheat the reactor and start to lose stability. If stability number ever reaches zero, the reactor core has gone critical and the only way to save ourselves is to eject the core. This lever does nothing while the core stability is not zero. So you can flick this all day long, it's okay. Once the core stability is zero, we are all going to die, at which point this lever does indeed eject the core. Um, running with the safety toggle turned off is a very powerful move, but very risky. I'll also note this button over here. This is your overheat or I don't know, overload, overcharge, overclock button. I'm not sure, but doing this, you'll notice our power use, our total usage here is gonna change. In fact, all the bars change. What's the deal with this? Well, turning this on dramatically overclocks the reactor, increasing its uh, power output dramatically. It's gonna go from here to like, about here, right? This is sort of where the bar is going to be, except that would be outside the display. So what it does is it scales everything down so it still fits. But if we turn, if we go ahead and enable the overclock, the total usage has gone up again quite a bit. Everything's shrunk to represent it. We are making something like, I don't know, probably 25,000 uh, megawatts at this point. But while it's in overcharge mode, even though we're not actually using more power, the temperature um, of the reactor is growing quite quickly. And in fact, if we were to do anything that would start consuming power, this would shoot up ridiculously fast. It's a great way to get extra power in combat, but it does overheat quite quickly. If you want to avoid a shutdown, well, you do have some tools over here. We can go and pump some coolant into the reactor. And right now, if we go to low, temperature is actually going to go down. Now, if we were using a lot of power because we we're mid combat, our shields were having to recharge, our weapons were recharging, the pilot was doing a bunch of maneuvers and therefore consuming a bunch of uh, engineering power as well, most likely the temperature would still go up on low. You could go to high coolant usage. This will burn through the coolant reserves quite quickly, but it will be a good emergency button to try to keep your engines cool. Um, if your coolant is, uh, is runs out, then you can't use this anymore. Uh, coolant can be recharged. It can be purchased at any automated trade station. It's very cheap very cheap, but I mean, if you run out, then it's a little awkward. So you're gonna to wanna to manage your coolant supply, not because you're worried about the cost, but because if you do get into an intense fight and you've already spent all your coolant, well, things might not go so well. Um, so in practice as the engineer, you can probably do something like max all these uh, values out, sort of by default. And then when combat starts, you can start to make adjustments over there, especially as your captain is saying things, you know, maybe it's really important that the shields are getting supercharged. You're going to do that. You might divert away some power from the engines uh, and maybe the weapons to help the shields recharge some more, you know, limit the science lab because they might be doing all sorts of shenanigans that use power. You know, how, where, where the sweet spots are for this, it really varies. I'll also, in this video, is getting a little longer than I wanted, but the engineering's got a lot to talk about. We've also got the auxiliary reactor over here that powers a bunch of different subsystems. Um, some, a lot of these subsystems can be turned off quite frequently. And if that happens, that power actually gets sent over to the main power distribution grid, which means we have more power available without stressing our reactor. For example, the atrium healing, which uh, is in the science lab, that's the, the medical bay that heals us. If no one is injured, we can go and turn this off and this will add an extra 800 megawatts to our reactor. You'll see that you see the bar go up, right? We have more power. Um, air filters actually only matter if there's toxicity in the air, which doesn't isn't the case most of the time. You can generally have this off. You can have the lights off because people have flashlights, although I generally prefer to leave them on. Um, projectile aim assist. When you're shooting the turrets, if you're using a projectile weapon, like the plasma cannon, for example, it'll have a little um, leading target on a moving enemy ship to try to tell you where to like lead your aim. If you're only using a direct fire weapon, like the direct laser turret or the main cannon, you really don't need this. So you could turn that off. And again, more power for the main systems. Uh, cyber defense can actually be off a surprising amount of the time um, because viruses are generally going to get in anyway, one way or another. Uh, there's some sweet spots involving mathematics for when cyber defense being on is quite strong versus being off. Uh, so you can uh, play with that. Intruder alarm. I mean, it's literally just an alarm to let you know an intruder's on board. You'll probably know that pretty quickly. Hopefully, maybe I don't know. So it might be safe to run with that off. Um, if you're not using missiles, you don't really care about the uh, missile lock on. You can still lock on missiles when this is off. It's just going to be very slow. But all of a sudden, if we do, if we run like this, an extra 5,600 megawatts is a huge boost to our total reactor output without generating more heat very powerful. And in fact, if you need extra power, if the captain's, you know, demanding more and you're doing your best Scotty moment, you can run with the oxygen generator turned off for a little while. The O2 level over here is going to start to drop. I mean, unless you have a, you know, full robot crew or something like that, um, the oxygen level will start to drop as these silly humans are breathing in air, but you can run with it off for a little while to get the extra power. Just, you know, 
make sure to turn it on before everyone suffocates or get everyone into an exosuit. That's another option. Um, we haven't really talked about upgrading over here. Uh, that's not critical for starting off on play. It is going to be something you're going to want when you collect scrap. Uh, you can go and look at your systems. There's, there's a bunch, um, but like the reactor over here, we know the reactor is clearly quite important. Um, if we went, if we collect three scraps, which actually is pretty easy to get, we can upgrade the fusion reactor from a level one to a level two, which increases the maximum temperature as well as the power output. It's very powerful. Um, uh, upgrading components in general is very strong. Uh, upgrading the reactor is one of my favorite things to do. I mean, shield generator. Uh, I mean, jump module is quite nice for like charges faster, jumps further away. That's pretty sexy. Uh, the hull is also pretty good to upgrade, but you are going to want to coordinate this with your captain before you spend these upgrades because your captain might be planning on buying a new, better base hull, right? They could be looking at like, you know, super duper awesome hull uh, of doom or whatever the item might be called. Um, and so if you spend time upgrading this hull, you might be kicking yourself for having quote unquote wasted that. So you'll want to do a little bit of coordination. Like um, as much as I really love upgrading the fusion reactor, you, your captain might make it a priority, in fact, to upgrade, to buy a new and better advanced fusion reactor, in which case you might be better off upgrading your, your shields and your hull or something like that. So, you know, have some conversations and do that. Um, if your ship does get shut down, which can happen for a variety of reasons, you can reboot it. By the way, if you are infested with viruses, turning off your entire ship is one way to resolve it. If you want to start your ship again, just read the directions. Pull lever one, boot ship OS. Pull lever two. Prime warp core. Enable shields. System is active, but you'll notice our screens are still turned off. What? What is this? Well, someone has to be on the bridge on the science console because there's reasons you might decide to turn those off. You need to go on the science console and do a manual override. You can see here so that all the consoles are back up and things are running once again. Um, I haven't actually talked about like away missions and things like that. I mean, I did very briefly mention you can teleport over here. If you go to a system with a planet, you can go down there as well. There are also uh, missions that you can pick up on these stations. Um, it can be quite easy. If you're the science officer, you have a scanner. Or in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spawn a science bot. And as the captain, I'm going to go to science bots inventory. Oh, he hasn't collected his inventory. That's weird. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Or maybe it's because we're not in the same location. Oh, there you go. Um, so the science bot has a scanner. I'm just going to send it to myself. And then I'm going to equip the scanner. Now, you can go to it over here and look at it on the screen. But if you don't have it selected, you still get the scanner interface up here, which is really handy. And now if we do this, we get lots of little dots and things, including you can see right up the top of the screen, you see exclamation marks, those are quests. So the easiest way to find quests on this big station, and there's a good number of them, is uh, get a scanner equipped. Um, either get your science officer to go and do it. There's another one over there, somewhere over in that distance, um, or steal it from them, or just buy yourself one. There are vendors on this uh, station. You can go and buy some extra handheld equipment um, and stuff like that. So um, exploring this big station is quite a lot of fun. Oh, I will note, uh, cause it's a little confusing. This person here, it's not really a quest. This is actually to opt out of random quests being handed to you while you're going around and exploring. So with this quest quote unquote accepted, I believe we will not get um, missions while we're flying around. And if we end that, now we will get missions as we fly around. Um, so you can choose to opt out. Although it looks like if we've opted back in, we can't um, we can't cancel it again. Uh, but uh, there you go. Anyway, that's pretty much it. Oh, I didn't talk about the jetpack. If you uh, double tap your spacebar, you've got a jetpack. It's also bound by default to your mouse keys. You can um, you can rebind this as well, but it's quite handy. You can see the fuel really handy for getting around it like it immediately arrests your uh, your falling as well. So you don't take falling damage. There you go and you can cross chasms, but it is a little bit risky sometimes. Um, yeah, tab screen. I guess I, I talked briefly about talents, ships, your personal inventory. We can check our missions over here. Oh, as captain, you can also hit Z. Well, anyone can hit Z, but the captain has the ability to give commands uh, to your crew. It'll pop up here. Most likely you'll be doing this in Discord in, you know, if you're playing multiplayer, but it is worth noting that your bots do listen to these commands and will do things. So, you know, by default you're on. Oh, see, I said stay close to captain. See these green dots? That's my crew running towards me. There you go. Hello. 
I have a I have a bot AI set up so that uh, not everyone comes. The uh, I thought I didn't think the engineer would come. I thought it would be the weapons officer, and I thought the engineer was going to stay on the ship. Oh, there he is. Hello, weapon bot. Um, you can tweak the crew AI's behavior considerably over here. You can make some massive changes to the logic of your crew and make them much, much, much smarter, uh, which is pretty phenomenal. Uh, and uh, so I, I, there were some people who complained that the bots aren't brilliant in the game and some of the, the reviews for the game. Um, admittedly, I think the piloting bot, I, I don't really care for their in-combat piloting. Um, I think they could do that a little bit stronger um, in terms of positioning. But other than that, the bots seem to do a really, really good job if you tune their AI to behave the way that, uh, that you want them to. So... Um, Although, I suppose they could have shipped a better one out of the box. It's actually, the default one's pretty good out of the box. Um, but you can make it considerably stronger. You can you can do some real shenanigans with the science and the engineer bots in particular that I absolutely love. So, um, yeah, I think that completes this little crash course on the game. We haven't even, like, we haven't actually done anything. I didn't fly anywhere or do anything, but this should be all the tools you need to actually play the game, which is pretty good. Uh, these little red bips, these are just distress calls with uh, generic missions, so we might want to set a course to go there and deal with that because they were timed um, and can give you some extra rewards, which is kind of cool. Uh, you can play generically. You can just fly around, you know, beating up pirates. You can fly around being a pirate, uh, especially depending on what faction you choose. Uh, there is a main quest, which is to find the lost colony, at least in the scenario you've chosen. And yeah, there are lots and lots of uh, quests that you can pick up along the way as well. Am I going to make this without dying? I am. So there you go. So this person here... For example, has a real actual quest for us. Um, yep, sounds good. Uh, what's this? We need uh, some cargo was lost, medical supplies. Okay, absolutely. That sounds like a good sort of Star Trek-y style mission for us to do. Oh yeah, okay, you are done. Okay. And then if we check the missions, we can see it there. We got to go to Moiva Seven. Where is Moiva Seven? Well, it's in Sector Fifty One. If we don't you can't quickly find it, you can just hit the magnifying glass and it'll zoom you there. Uh, mission sectors have this little M. So we could be like, oh, yeah, hold on. We want to go over there. Boy, that's a long trip. Could we get there any faster? Well, yeah, it would actually be quicker to go to Moiva if we go through this jump gate instead. So what we can do is from the system we're in, we can use the warp gate to sector, sector 1049. And then from sector 1049, we can easily just travel over to Moiva there. It's going to take us to maybe three jumps. Hard to tell the exact range uh, on things on our little radius over here. Pro I suspect we'd probably have to do three total jumps. It's probably to here, then here, then there. But um, but anyway, and then we could do that. Uh, the galaxy is shuffled every time you start a brand new game. Things will be in slightly different positions. The starter quests are always pretty similar, but um, but other than that, yeah. Anyway, I think, uh, I think Pulsar Lost Colony is a great game. I've enjoyed playing it with friends a lot, and actually I have a pretty good time with bots as well. Um, it, I mean, it, this is one of those things that definitely shines the most as a social game, especially if you're like, into the role playing of it all, but um, but it's still kind of fun to play on your own. Thanks for watching, folks. I'll see you next time, and hopefully, I'll see you online in Pulsar Lost Colony. Bye bye.